Okay, let's now proceed to the two final topics. The first one starts with a quite different view on high heat flux applications and for that we need, of course, very specific materials. In general, I call them high heat flux materials since they are thermally high, very highly loaded. Uh, subdivision into two groups as well as application is probably providing you a better uh, view on the things. The first wall, the blanket wall, has to be shielded also from interaction with the um, plasma and uh, this is one application, an armor application and that's why I call these materials, which are mainly tungsten alloys, first wall armor materials. Then much more critical and important is the armor and uh, armor application for the diverter, which is even more highly loaded in terms of uh, several conditions. And finally, high heat flux materials will and must also be applied to the structural parts of any coolant. Typically these are pipes or usually are pipes. So uh, for water cooled diverters these uh, are copper alloys or composites, whatever. And uh, for helium cooled diverter concepts this is um, a big question mark, but well. In any case, it must be a tungsten alloy or composite or something like that. So these are three different applications and let's quickly go through the issues or main problems related to that. Again, the overview, you remember, we are currently here at the step of constructing ether and for ether there are no <coughs> let's say, very problematic requirements. That's why either can be built with <laughs> usual standard materials, as I have explained. But for the demo, where we have to take into account a much higher neutron load and also for all uh, reactor types beyond demo towards the power plant, this is the main issue. Standard materials can and have been used up to here, but for everything else in the future we need new concepts and this require also new materials. Unfortunately, or well, I don't know whether it's unfortunately, maybe it's a logical consequence, but most concepts which have been developed during the last decades didn't take into account that they are based on non-existing materials. This is often the case that the designers, well, didn't attend to this lesson, for example, so they have no idea about material properties and also no idea of what could be done with material development. And this is, was also a severe case here in uh, demo research and development. All almost all concepts, or we I will show you later, all concepts are quite critical from my point of view, or I hope also from your point of view, from the point of view from a material scientist or from a materials expert. So design without material knowledge makes no sense, and of course the other way around would also be problematic, so I hope that this will show you that exactly uh, or uh, specifically component development and design requires not only one point of view but at least uh, design knowledge and issues combined with material issues. A specific case in fusion development is uh, materials have to be tailor made or tailor uh, suited developed. We need some new kind of materials. Of course I cannot show you solutions but I will show you the way where it 
goes in which direction the development or R&D goes at the moment. Let's start with the wall loads of the first wall. And also there, is, there are some uncertainties and this is due to plasma physics and well, I want to avoid this specific topic because that's um, yeah. <laughs> very um, difficult or specific. However, there are certain features or one basic features one has to know. If a plasma stops burning immediately, this is called a disruption. Then due to this disruption, this is like, or I, I compare it with the sun where you have uh, uh, eruptions when magnetic fields are crossing, then uh, you have a very high energetic impulse of loading and such eruptions have an immense power density. And in generally, they have to be uh, to be avoided during any uh, plasma operation. If they occur, then uh, you can shut down your plant and start building a new one. That's uh, the, the general conclusion out of that. So hopefully they will get this somehow managed. The next less severe damage what can happen is a, a vertical displacement of the plasma if it stays not centered inside the donut but uh, it can be displaced somehow. Then the plasma comes into contact with the first wall, for example. This gives also a rather high energetic, but not as high as disruption, but uh, energetic interaction and, well, will at least melt down some parts of the surfaces and also most probably results in a complete damage of the blankets, so they had to be replaced. Also, this kind of off-normal events we should avoid. The next thing is that plasma at the edge, at, at, at the very edge, near the surface of the first wall, is not stationary. There are high frequently small um, I don't know how to say this, but they are called etched localite modes. There are tiny interactions at the edge of the plasma, permanently at a high frequency, depending on the plasma operation. At the moment, uh, there are some measures to, to mitigate this and to uh, avoid this, but finally only, I, I think ITER will probably uh, give more information about that and this is one of the severest problems at all in the whole plasma physics and plasma operation because uh, if you cannot avoid this in general this would mean that we had to live with a uh, high frequent cyclic thermal loading of the whole surface and these ELMS edge localized modes have a power uh, density of about one gigawatt per square meter. The frequency is every 500 microseconds, so uh, there are uh, thermal loads or thermal uh, uh, um, steps in the order of uh, 10 to the 6. Then the here is a diagram over pulse duration and power density. And the normal, well, hopefully we don't have to live with that, but for the moment that's not clear yet. What is clear? That the diverter will be operated in the average around 5 megawatt per square meter and pulse lengths, okay, this is depending on the, on, on the um, power plant or on the demo design. These uh, numbers here are either, but they would be much longer for demo or in any case for a power plant. So what we have to take further into account is neutron <coughs> induced material degradation like in the steels. So the same is true here for all this um, high heat flux materials and that's the general outline. What 
requirements do we have for these high heat flux materials? It's clear they need uh, rather high thermal conductivity, as high as possible. This uh, also is more or less combined with a high melting point. We need all the adequate mechanical properties in these materials. They should, as always in fusion technology, be in low activation, show as less as possible transmutation and uh, damage under neutron irradiation. They have to be compatible, uh, com compatible with uh, plasma and coolant. And well, again, it wouldn't hurt if they would be cheap and uh, not be rather expensive. With this information, you could go through the table of elements and make a pre-selection of elements which would require these um, constraints. Let's say a melting point of at least 2,000 Kelvin is required for such uh, thermally high-loaded things. And the thermal conductivity should at least be 50 watts per meter Kelvin. That's uh, already more than a usual steel has. OK, with this requirement, you can down select the whole elementary table down to these elements. These are left over, which fulfill these requirements. Next step, availability and cost. If you take this into account, then uh, you end up only with chromium, carbon, niobium, molybdenum, and tungsten. If you take further into account that we want to have a low or at least medium activation capability of the materials, you are down to chromium, tungsten, and carbon. And well, finally, irradiation damage rules out carbon because this transmute rather easily into other elements. So we have chromium and tungsten. Hmm. These are not so much degrees of freedom. But finally, <coughs> there is another uh, constraint, uh, TRC. This means recrystallization temperature. If you want to start with a fine microstructure, with, which is most often useful, and you want to keep it that way, then you have to restrict material to a certain maximum temperature. And if you take this into account, but there would many other constraints also, which finally will leave you there. And this is the reason why we are talking mainly about tungsten if we are talking about high heat flux materials in fusion technology. Well, what can you do with tungsten? I have give you some ideas um, at the seminar at the beginning, but this was the general reason why we end up with tungsten. For blanket armor, there are two concepts. Beryllium is used in ether, but you can forget uh, beryllium for any other application. That's only possible for, for ether. So uh, in any other um, tokamak, tungsten will be the material of choice for the first wall in blankets for, for the armor. In diverter, armor will be used or can be used um, yeah, as armor. For structural materials, depending on the cooling and operating temperature, also copper chrome zerg would be an alternative. This is used in the ether diverter and could also be, we will uh, see and studying at the moment, could also be uh, a good choice for the demo. But it's not sure yet whether you can really use copper chrome zerg to uh, real power plants. But well, step by step, these are the main applications. And well, steels we have already dealt with. We will skip that. So let's start with first wall armor materials. There is a new idea which goes um, in a specific direction. I will make it rather short. Pure tungsten could be sprayed on the first wall or plated with thin plates and so on. So I skip the usage of pure tungsten as a thin armor layer for the first wall. This is, uh, 
I think, not a very interesting and not a very um, demanding issue. But imagine if the power plant operates or has been operated and running for a few months or hopefully years or whatever, and then uh, the worst case scenario happens. What is the worst case scenario? Aliens are coming down and destroying the plant or, well, uh, uh, impact of a meteorite or something like this, which immediately destroys your uh, vacuum vessel. Then you have air ingress and a really hot surface of tungsten. This tungsten, unfortunately, has already been transmuted into radioactive elements. And now, you also remember, maybe a slide, what happens to tungsten at temperatures higher than 600 C. If it comes in contact with oxygen, it completely oxidizes. And the tungsten oxide is very unfortunately volatile. This means it immediately, immediately evaporates in the uh, uh, surroundings. So in this worst case, we would have radioactive tungsten oxide dust in the air. And well, of course, that's a, a, worth, a, a really the worst case. But still, there was an idea to prevent it, to use a tungsten mixture, a tungsten alloy, which automatically builds a self-passivating surface in order to prevent oxidizing and, and uh, to produce this volatile radioactive stuff. This is a study what happens to tungsten surface after such an, ex let's say, accidental loss of coolant. And uh, this means that after shutting down, you have for a few days or even weeks, a rather high temperature. That's due to the radioactive decay, even if you have shut down everything. And so the temperature would be up to 1200 C, or at least higher than 1000 C. And this is the scenario. So the development of such self passivating tungsten alloys looks like that. Here is the structural material, Eurofair, for example. Then uh, we have a layer of several millimeters of this tungsten plus alloying elements. And uh, under normal operation, this would be end up at surface temperatures around 600 C or so. In an accidental loss, temperature would raise to 1200 C. And then due to this thermal overload, the idea is to produce out of these elements, which have been alloyed to tungsten, to produce an oxide layer which is stable. So under normal operating condition, the whole alloy acts like usual tungsten. It still has a very high and good thermal uh, conductivity. But then, with a contact to air, it loses, of course, its conductivity, but it shields itself from further oxidation. That's the idea. An automatic or intelligent law, so to say. And um, here is a study what happens. For example, uh, a mixture of tungsten, silicon, and chromium in the surface and in the bulk at, at, at normal condition. It's a, a set looking and behaving uh, as tungsten. And then after uh, increase of temperature and contact with air, it forms a complex shaped oxide layer, which then prevents further oxidation. Typical alloying elements to tungsten in that case are silicon, chromium, and also zirconium. And well, to make the long story short, this is already the end of the story and what they have done. They have tried to uh, produce such materials, tested them. This is the oxidation test here over inverse temperature. And the black line, which shows uh, the usual oxidation behavior or oxidation rates of tungsten, you see very high oxidation rate at higher temperatures. Um, 
This is the benchmark, the comparison, and depending on what you produce and what you alloy, you can win several orders of magnitudes in, uh, in the oxidation behavior. The factor is yeah, between 100 and 1000 of improvement in the loss of oxidation in such an event. This is how the material looks in a cut from microstructure. Here, this would be the bulk, the tungsten alloy with several phases uh, producing due to the mix. And then we have three different layers of oxides mixed with chromium, silicon, and so on. And this uh, several layers are really stable and yeah, look very promising. Um, one drawback of these materials up to now, they are yeah, produced in Spain, in uh, Seid, that's uh, in San Sebastian. Uh, to really do this trick and automatic self preservating the, the, this group claims that at the moment you, you have to mill, to mechanically alloy these alloys. And this is a, a rather expensive uh, type of production. So at the moment, in the future, next five years or so, this is really a big issue in the whole tungsten community in fusion area to try to produce this alloy in a less expensive way. The next step or next application then is in general how to coat first of all, how to bring tungsten on this yeah, several hundred square meters of surface. You can simply weld it or whatever. So um, tungsten spraying, plasma spraying is a relatively easy technology to do this. This has been studied and uh, well with micro tomography we have a rather high sophisticated way of really examine in three dimension the inside of these materials. This uh, is like well, if you undergo a tomography uh, examination, you can step by step reconstruct in three dimensions the microstructure of these materials. And um, here, this is how such a coating looks like. And the end result of tomography, if you go step by step through materials, the area of interest is here where we have the, the interlayer and where you have to examine whether tungsten really sticks good to the steel surface and maybe here you can see it even better. Uh, blue, that's the tungsten part, white, that's the steel part. Uh, the other way around, blue, that's the steel and white is the tungsten and you see there is some inner diffusion in the layers in between and in principle it looks rather promising. Here at the first side, at the second side if you color the pores which are produced in between in yellow then you see that it's not so perfect after the fabrication because these are all more or less bubbles so in principle, we have, a, again, a nice technology, but in detail, well, there are some uh, problems still to overcome. Coatings can be produced also chemically and especially with uh, ionic liquids. That's also a high sophisticated uh, type of materials development and uh, production. Here you can grow layers on uh, any substrates or whatever. They have done here uh, also a rather tricky thing where you can uh, grow tungsten layers on Eurofair, for example. The problem here is in the chemistry and, well, I don't like chemistry. I don't know about you, so <laughs> let's keep about 
the details here, but I just wanted to show you things are can be uh, worked out in several ways. So, as a quick conclusion for first wall armor materials, there are some possible solutions. They still need to be uh, refined and uh, further examined. Alternative coating processes are all also available. And, well, if worst comes to worst, you could still think about, again, diffusion bonding and, and using thin um, tungs and plates and somehow glue them on the first wall. That's uh, one of the fall back options. Of course, another option which we always have, and uh, as a material scientist, this is my favorite, I blame the plasma guys and say, that's your job. You have to take care about your plasma and that it does not interact with my material and then we are safe. Good, this is not such a pressing issue compared to other topics which we come now. That's the diverter. On a diverter, these armor parts and armor materials have a much more uh, difficult job to do. And since we don't have many fusion reactors, not even one, unfortunately, we, we have to do it by simulation, by uh, high heat flux test facilities. There are two different categories. One is that you use big electron beam guns where you can perform the thermally really high loads on the surfaces of these materials and where you can al also simulate these high frequent etched localized modes I have talked about before. This is e uh, done rather easily with electron beams. Another one is the use of uh, neutral particle beams. Um, for this, we have also facilities uh, in, in Gauching near Munich, Gladys, that's the one here. Here you can use a mixture of hydrogen and helium, which equals or is comparable to the real plasma in a fusion device. Here, with electrons, that's a bit tricky because you know electrons have a rather high penetration depth and so they most probably, again, overestimate material failure. But still, this is what we have, and so that's the only things we can use for the moment. And also, this is a rather broad and, and very complicated topic, so I use this slide as a summary. This is the typical result of electron beam thermal shock tests. Here, for example, 100 of these ELM cycles have been simulated. And the result of a given material, these are five different materials, the result is uh, plotted into such figures over temperature. And here we have the power density used for the single electron shocks. Let's start from bottom. Green, green color means the surface of the material shows no damage at all, so this is what we dream of. Then uh, blue means there is some surface modification, but it is still not a crack or something other identifiable. It's just a modification of some way in the surface. Red, that's already critical. Here a crack network develops on the surface after the test. And, well, yellow is somewhere in between where we can identify small cracks. And by this, such um, damage tables are produced. And what you want to see or what we, w what we favor is a result like that where we have many green plots and, well, at less as possible red dots. So this is how the materials at the moment will be characterized by thermal shocks. This is the result after helium loading of the surface. Here, um, in this neutral beam facility, two megawatt per square meter thermal load, which corresponds in that case uh, to first wall conditions in a, yeah, 
relatively low temperature area, but still here uh, for the first wall in the blankets, you see that the surfaces are mm, funny looking after the test. This is a focused iron beam cut into the material to see what happens uh, at the vicinity of the surface. Here you can see a grain boundary, here also, and uh, here also. And from this picture you see, depending on the crystal, crystal lattice orientation, the surface degradation that's um, by physical sputtering. There are uh, atoms shot out from the surface by the incidenting helium particles. And depending on the orientation, the sputtering rate is more or less pronounced. That's a simple physical fact because the sputtering depends on crystal on the on the lattice orientation. That's for lower temperature. For higher temperature, it's uh, similar. If the temperature, uh, if the power goes up to 10 megawatts per square meter in 850C, this corresponds approximately to diverter applications for uh, water cooled diverter applications, uh, then we see a similar effect on the surface. So up to here, even if it looks uh, complicated and difficult, in principle it is not. There are strong surface modifications, but none of these are severe. It's only one result, if you start with a layer thickness of a few millimeters, after some time, this layer thickness will be reduced step by step due to the sputtering. This is in a higher magnification. You see, this is what left over, and step by step, the surface is eroded away. But now, if the surface temperature is much more increased, what happens then? And well, here we are already in a rather critical area, around 2000 C or higher. Then the surface starts to change completely. There is some coral structure-like uh, looking surface that has nothing to do with the original tungsten. That's a complete change of surface morphology. And in a cross-section view, you see that this uh, funny structure goes down uh, two to three micrometers. Well, at the first sight, that's not so deep, but still, surface modification happens. And if you take into account that the helium particles cannot penetrate so deep, they only will uh, penetrate the surface by 70 nanometers. That's a very, very tiny. Uh, area where they interact. So this cannot be due to helium. It's just an effect of temperature plus this helium interaction at the surface. So it's a, a natural behavior of tungsten. And again, here in the cross-section, you see that also at lower temperature, well, they are still high compared to other materials, but 1400 and, and 1000 C, that's relatively low for tungsten, but still in this area, the surface is modified by the occurrence of bubbles. Nobody knows yet why that happens, but it's an observation, so this does happen. And here, the major concern is that the sputtering rates will be increased by such surface modification. And this is another important and interesting field of uh, investigation and research. As a conclusion, not many degrees of freedom in developing better performing materials are available. You have seen this. What can we do with pure tungsten? Not much. You can mix it a, a little bit with other and then building more phases. So there is a main constriction here. We also need much more knowledge, well, same old, same about irradiation effects, because at the moment we have almost no information about uh, irradiation effects in tungsten mixed with thermal loading. And there is also no fallback option. There is no alternative for uh, other materials. It 
S to be tungsten or a tungsten alloy. In any case, physics, the physical part is dominating here. We can only test and observe, but since there is no, no knowledge and no um, ideas, and I don't think that's purely physics, you have to tolerate all these uh, degradations in the one way or other. And this has a high impact on the further design of diverters because you have to know the sputtering rate, the erosion rate, and well, of course, you have to, to know it before you start operating. You have to know whether you need 10 millimeter as a sacrificial layer or five millimeters. That makes a big difference. That's obvious, I think. Now let's come to another funny idea. If we are restricted to tungsten and nothing else, what can you do? There is still the idea, as with any other, any other materials, you can uh, <coughs> fabricate composite materials. And uh, if you are restricted to tungsten, you have to fabricate a composite material of tungsten and tungsten. And uh, the idea is to use tungsten fibers embedded in tungsten matrix and hope that you end up with the same effect like in uh, carbon reinforced fiber materials or composite materials that you have a crack deflection. That's the, the usual pseudo uh, ductility um, <coughs> idea of this composite materials. Uh, another possible idea is also to use tungsten fiber in cover if you have to increase uh, the strength of cover. But that's an old story and I don't have the time to go there further on this idea with tungsten. Let's first consider tungsten fiber, tungsten composite materials. The first tests have been performed on rather tiny specimens which have used only one fiber which has been embedded and then the crack development through such a tiny specimen was tested and observed. This is the typical crack behavior of such one fiber materials. Uh, the same thing has been done in copper, but instead of tungsten they used silicon carbide because this was uh, probably easier to manufacture or simply they had uh, a silicon carbide at hand but no tungsten. But the effect again is the same. So here it's about principle. And again in the 3D view, uh, tomography examination, oh, the media has not found that's a, forget this video. It's just, it shows you how the fibers will be pulled out of the material. Um, the problem here, however, is to densify or to fabricate this fiber matrix complex. Up to now, what is used is a stack or a layer of these uh, fibers and then uh, a deposition of tungsten or, in the other case, copper. And uh, this matrix material grows and grows and grows. At some time, uh, it doesn't grow anymore, and so it leaves a rather porous structure behind of it. And to really produce fully dense materials in that way, there was a, um, last year they pro proceeded and progressed uh, much more. But this is still another way of developing such, um, let's say, difficult to fabricate fiber reinforced materials. So this is also a rather prominent R&D study at the moment. Now let's come to things which are more easy to produce. Uh, that's structural, well, for water cooling only, that's structural materials for diverter applications. Um, <coughs> if you are enjoying beach, then you will suffer from about uh, 0.001 megawatt per square meter heat load. So that's not too much depending on your personal view. If we are talking about 
3 megawatts, then this already corresponds to the uh, vicinity of the nozzles of rocket motors. Just that you have an imagination of what we are talking here in terms of heat load. 6 megawatt per square meter you can see in Almeria, for example, that's the, the solar towers that they use. This produces in the range uh, 6 megawatt per square meters heat load. And for me it was also new and quite uh, astonishing in electrical industry for radar applications and antenna and whatever. They need uh, to remove heat in the order of 50 megawatt per square meter because these are tiny um, things to cool down and with a really high heat density. So we tried to compare fusion, the worst case where we count, uh, uh, take into account short loads of 20 megawatts per square meter, we are somewhere here in this vicinity. Especially from, from this electrical application, the question was, is there something we can learn from them or adapt? And uh, well, typically they are in the range of, uh, let's say, 1 to 50 megawatts per square meter, but they, their application temperature, of course, is much, much lower. They are restricted due to the semiconductors to 150C, otherwise the electronics will be destroyed. And here, state-of-the-art and, and uh, available solutions is a two-phase material consisting of molybdenum and copper. This uh, combination has still a high thermal conductivity and a low thermal expansion coefficient. So in, in principle, that's uh, what we also would like to have in fusion. A set typical application are in radar technology, but also high power LEDs and uh, <coughs> antenna and so on. Now let's see, since there are so many fusion devices running at the moment, Tokamak, Stellarators and whatever. Ah, oh, by the way, yesterday I have uh, visited CIMAT. There also is a Stellarator, quite impressive. Uh, another one, I think at the moment it's uh, the, the, the only one worldwide at the moment, so that's uh, really impressive to see. There is a first um, test reactor of a, a bit bigger shape uh, in under construction at the moment in the northern part of Germany. That's uh, also W7X that's called. Uh, Torre Supra <coughs> that's also um, in, in, in France a project which is running under construction. And all these, okay, beside ERA, need diverters. So there, at the moment, there are real manufacturing of such parts, and they use materials which are available, of course. Since all these are water-cooled, here the structural material is, of course, not tungsten and not steel. It is copper, a very specific type of copper. It's a precipitation-hardened type of copper, copper chrome zerg, and most of these parts for the cooling structure are of copper chrome zerg, and then on top of this cooling structure they um, bond tungsten armor parts for the shielding. And this is how the components look like. That's uh, the eater cassettes. Uh, for the diverter, and uh, well, these are for stellar radars where you don't need such large areas, and this is for another top topomac, as already mentioned in France. Again, this is uh, also another example. Down near the water coolant, there is copper chrome zerg. Then there are some interlayers to accommodate the differences in thermal expansion between tungsten and copper, or sometimes they also use silicon carbide at the top for the first stage of operation. Then uh, there is some surface modifications to glue or bond both things better together. This is um, how it works here. Then in ITER there are two parts, at 
least this have been the plans. By now they are already shifted uh, further, but never mind. The principle is the same. In some part of the couple chrome sur pipe there is a swirl to enhance the cooling capability and cooling efficiency. It also increases the cooling surface, so you can remove more heat. That's the structure, and the structure is surrounded by an armor part which uh, does the trick for the plasma shielding and operation. At the end, somewhere where we are outside of um, the high heat flux part, uh, finally, usual 316 steel will be used. That's the strategy. But the limits of couple chrome circ, they are rather narrow because it is a precipitation hardening material. Um, these precipitates of chromium and zirc, zirconium, they are, without irradiation, they are uh, going into solution again at about yeah, six, seven hundred centigrade. So, in, in general, this would be not a problem. But with irradiation, and if you remember, this was another part, another story for the irradiation damage. With all this neutron irradiation, <coughs> then these precipitates are not stable anymore, and they dissolve at much lower temperature. And this dissolution you can easily see on this green curve. This is a strength curve from tensile tests, somehow uh, modified for, for the designer, so, but it's uh, proportional to, to the strengths. And the, this line here is the unirradiated condition, and you see with higher temperature, of course, strength goes down, as usual in materials, but not severely. But with irradiation, then around 300 C, it goes down rather quickly, and already at 400 C, the material has no strength anymore. So this is the main case and the main limitation of coupled chrome zirc in combination with water coolant. At the moment, or not at the moment, in principle, it can only be safely used up to 300 C and also not for an infinite long time. This uh, is a problem and so again another big area in R&D and materials development goes in this direction to improve copper chrome zirc or copper in general and again there is only one possibility how you can do it by the use of uh, composite materials. It would either strengthen copper chrome zirc by particles, fibers or uh, thin foils. That's the only possibility. For the lower temperature, copper chrome zirc is also restricted, like steel, because uh, uh, due to the hardening um, in copper chrome zirc, that's 200 cent centigrade. And so in the end, there is a narrow operating window for nuclear application, and this is somewhere between 200 and 300 C. That's the first part of problems in high heat flux materials. If you have any questions to this, please. Yep, uh, microphone. Um, I'm having a concern. Uh, if tungsten goes into the plasma, it's going to take out most of the energy of the plasma. So this might be a big issue for plasma physicists, right? Yes, it is. But again, this is a tricky topic. But in, in general, for, for your information, if you don't know it, the plasma needs to be kept pure in order to have the fusion reaction running. So if you need uh, deuterium and tritium, but with time you produce other elements like helium, which contaminates the plasma. And also with the uh, interaction of all the surrounding walls, there are uh, impurities coming into the plasma consisting of whatever you have 
steel, copper, or whatever is in the vicinity. And uh, depending on the mass, or uh, probably more uh, than mass, let's say depending on very specific issues of the elements, of the impurity elements, the plasma tends not to burn further, it goes out. That's why you have constantly clean the plasma. Remove all these particles besides deuterium and tritium. And then there are some elements which virtually um, killing plasma burning. And one of the worst cases is unfortunately tungsten. But well, what can you do? On the one hand, you need tungsten because there is no other choice to fulfill the armor uh, application. And on the other hand, well, you have to keep the plasma burning. So at the moment, there are many experimental uh, investigations going on which use tungsten as uh, armor and uh, see how it affects the plasma and okay, Good news here, and this might be the answer to your question. Uh, up to now, there is no concern. The, the amount of tungsten which really um, goes into the plasma is low enough to keep the plasma burning. Good. Otherwise, we could say bye-bye fusion. Right, <laughs> there's no other possibility. It, it works, it has been demonstrated well in chat. They, uh, in, in Cullum in England, they, they do such experiments also in, in Munich, in the Astex upgrade, uh, and it, it works and we can okay. live with it. So, yeah, it, my next question was if it's not tungsten, is there any other possibility? Other choice of uh, element? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Short answer. Thank you very much. Or a politically correct answer would be maybe, but I don't <laughs> like politics, so I say no. <laughs> Thank you. So since UPM or this school is engineering oriented, if I'm not wrong, I would finally come to some uh, design and engineering aspects and maybe performing the one or other exercise in evaluating one of the um, maybe not so major um, designer ideas. Let's put it this way. Let's first go through some helium cooled diverter designs, identify the problematic issues combined with these designs and finally see what our assessment as material experts would be. Rather quickly, you already noticed, this is uh, one of the oldest design where helium cooling by producing fine helium jets on the surface removes the energy, 10 megawatts uh, thermal load from the surface on top of such a tungsten symbol-like structure which is connected to steel uh, and is uh, on top just a pure tungsten or a tungsten alloy block is fixed to deal with the sputtering rates and temperature. This is the rather simple or easy looking design proposal for many years for helium cooled diverters. Now let's <coughs> identify the problematic issues here. Again, here we have high heat flux material which we have called tungsten armor application or armor material. The red one, this is a structural application since we have an inner pressure load on this part and of course, steel is also a structural material. And we have two types of joints. Here is a joint between tungsten and steel, a bit improved or uh, uh, supported by such a further conical sleeve or ring which uh, uh, supports this joint. There is, as always in the diverter, a high heat flux. 
And the positive thing of this idea is that it has, could be already demonstrated in non-irradiation tests, of course, that such high heat fluxes could be removed with this type of jet cooling. It works, in other words, in the unirradiated condition. In this uh, structural parts, we have small dimensions. This is also a positive thing, because if you have a thin layer and a high heat flux, then the temperature gradient produces not such a high temperature difference. If you have a big part, then the temperature differ difference between the upper and lower layer could be immense. So these are positive things, but there are also drawbacks. In order to fill the whole surface required for a diverter, it would need several hundred thousand of such single parts. So produce them is a, a mess. But to operate them could be a catastrophe, because if only one of this 100,000 finger fails, you have to shut down the whole reactor, and this costs you money without end. And I don't want to think about replacement, repairing, and so on. Another drawback is the joint. Joining tungsten to tungsten here, this is not the at the first sight, at least, a critical thing, because here we have no structural application. There is no mechanical load between the red and the orange part. But here, between tungsten and steel, where we have uh, high differences between thermal expansion and additional load from internal pressure, this is a important joint and not easy to do. So plus, minus. This is the critical thing here, a quick evaluation. Then there is this fully tungsten or almost fully tungsten concept from the uh, United States. It also relies on such single fingers. But the side walls, the structural parts, which are pressurized, are not of steel, but also made of tungsten. And so, in general, you could assemble all these parts, all our tungsten parts, uh, to big surface plates. And, well, you still need a lot of fingers, but since these fingers are a bit <coughs> bigger in dimension, you don't need as many as in the concept before. But, well, let's see this later more in detail. A deviation or uh, <coughs> another option would be also to use everything of tungsten for a structural material and internally replace the jet load by a uh, foam. What is the drawback and positive thing of this idea? Here again, it has been proved that a high heat flux could be removed with such a uh, design. Also, the same is true. We have thin, thin walls, small sizes, which reduces the thermal gradient. Here also is due to some, let's say, designer tricks. I don't believe it so much. But well, it goes in the right direction. At least partly, we have a double containment, which uh, increases safety a little bit. But you still need several 100,000 of this part, so this is also a drawback. And one of the other drawbacks is also uh, regarding to the joining. If you look at these um, cooling channels, and all these are single tungsten blades, which have to be joined there and there, and this over a length of a meter or so, you have a very, very long line where you have to perform a perfect joining between these tungsten parts. This certainly is a drawback. But here, in the other concept, it was joining tungsten to steel. Here it is joining tungsten to tungsten as a structural application. Now the ETO design. And this is not an idea anymore. It's a, a real concept or component since they has been built.
field. We used this idea or concept and thought, but only on paper, uh, that we could improve this finger design by using a uh, long pipe of tungsten composite. Also implement jet cooling with an inner pipe with holes on top. So in principle, the heat removal could also be up to 10 megawatts per square meter. But now with a more uh, specific focus on materials and their operating regime, we try to use otherwise, besides of this pipe, standard Eurofair or at least Eurofair ODS, which is not so expensive and has already been produced in larger amounts. This is a uh, very quickly the design concept here. That's, uh, well, comparatively simple. We have easy joints. There is nothing special about joining here. And uh, due to the size of these pipes compared or comparable to the Edo layout, it requires only a small number of parts. Small means m maybe several hundred or in that range, but not 100,000. And um, well, due to the use of standard or at least standard fusion materials, it's not so expensive. But it has also drawbacks because, well, for this pipe, we only have this laminated pipe concept like now. And here uh, we have to operate this thing at rather low temperature, otherwise we couldn't use standard materials. Low temperature for tungsten means that um, it might still be brittle, which is a problem. Also, due to the low temperature, there is no high performance. You cannot gain much energy out of such a coolant. But, well, as of today, it is a secondary problem. I would rather like to throw away this 20% of heat, which we could gain in the diverter, if we had a solution that diverter survives or works at all. So this is secondary. And well, what is more important is uh, pipe material is quite speculative. And in terms of readiness levels, I have talked to you, we are around zero or one. So at the very beginning. These are the concepts. Now, Let's see what other problems could be really identified or issues. Fabrication, I think, is not an issue. I've already shown this in the seminar. Uh, during all these years working with tungsten and, and such materials, fabrication could be done in several ways. And I think that's not an issue. But let's go further into detail. This concept requires a tungsten blade on top with many precise holes in it. So you have to drill holes of about 10 millimeter diameter into the tungsten blades. And I think I have shown you this is standard, this is feasible, not a problem. But what we have already seen, we have to produce walls for the cooling structure here with a broden-shaped surface at the end. How could you produce such things out of a blade? Well, you could do it by brute force, start with a thick blade and mill everything else away, but this would be waste of resources. So another way could be to heat up these blades and uh, forge them at the end so that we end up with this bone-shaped uh, surface at the end. But this requires a pressure forging technology which has not been developed yet. On the other hand, you have seen by this deep drawing experiments that it should be feasible at least, but still, that's not on the market yet. Now let's have a look on this joining. Joining of tungsten cannot be done by tungsten inert gas welding, not by laser, not by electron beam. Welding in general doesn't work, so the only other type of joining is brazing. And uh, with brazing materials, uh, it's rather important.
important to subdivide between structural applications that was uh, tungsten to tungsten joints with this uh, cooling walls. So here the bracing temperature should be at least higher or significantly higher than the operating temperature. Otherwise your brace is too soft or would melt away. So in that case we need to brace tungsten to tungsten of the side walls. Uh, we need a brace which much higher temperatures than uh, 900 to 1200 C for the bracing. Also, the bracing temperature must be low enough in order to avoid this recrystallization of tungsten, which would make it even more brittle. Also, if you have a bracing alloy, you have to avoid elements which form brittle phases if they react with tungsten. And these are the main restrictions for this type of joints. For the joining of tungsten to steel, the same consideration, but the temperatures are shifted because steel is operated lower temperatures. So the bracing temperature must be lower than 1100 C in order to avoid grain growth in steel. But it must also be higher than uh, the range of uh, the operating temperature, which is limited in steel's uh, in Euro fair to 550 if you will somehow be able to produce ODS deals in larger amounts then this will be 750 C. With this again also formation of brittle compounds must be uh, neglected. With this we can go through another exercise through the uh, table of elements. Let's first consider the bracing tungsten to tungsten of this fully diverter concept. And let's see which elements have uh, higher melting temperatures than 800 C because they could, be, could not be used. Temperature would be high, so these are not useful. And then the other way, the lower limit for melting point in order to uh, have stable braces, we have to rule out these elements. And, well, there are not many left over. So what you could use for a theoretical brace material to join tungsten to, to tungsten leaves this over. And we don't have to go through these details. This shows at what temperature brittle phases start to uh, form. That's from the phase diagrams. That's a standard from thermodynamics. And let's start with nickel and cobalt and iron in uh, one way. Braces of this uh, composition have been used. This is the result. And well, you see it that we have a lot of different phase formations here. All of them are brittle, and uh, in the end, this brace destroys your tungsten parts and therefore are not useful. This produces brittle joints. Tungsten and titanium, there is a separate chapter which I will not show you, but it's uh, within the document. This deals alone with this interesting topic. Uh, also here, to make it short, it doesn't work, or at least it's very difficult. And you can also easily imagine that when you see here, this was a study from the tungsten zirconium layer um, composite materials. We started with a structure like that and ended with uh, only zircon uh, tungsten uh, in the metallic which is also brittle, you see immediately that it also doesn't work. So this is not an option. That's difficult. That's brittle. I've never heard of somebody working with pure yttrium because it uh, usually uh, oxidizes rather fast. And also here I cannot imagine that this would be in one or other way useful. And well, I don't want to think about the costs. So 
platinum. Well, even I would like to study such materials, but uh, nobody would give me the budget required for that. Palladium might be a solution. Some, it's somewhere in between. It's uh, expensive, but uh, still affordable. So this could be still kept on the line. But you see, in principle, in general, joining tungsten to tungsten by brazing is not easy. Now let's see what's about uh, joining tungsten to steel. The same exercise. We rule out the uh, materials with too high melting points and too low, and this is even easier to assess. There are only four elements left over, and well, again, gold. I like the material, but uh, yeah, can't think about it. Uh, lanthanum also produces uh, many eutectics, uh, brittle phases. So in reality, silver would do the trick, but Activation, that's horrible in terms of activation. It produces long-living, uh, highly radioactive isotopes. And also, strength of silver is not impressive. Costs, OK, that's another side issue. So we are left with copper. But you know, copper is not one of the most strength materials. Copper is a well, could be taken into consideration, but even if you use this precipitation hardened cover, then the limits under irradiation I have shown you are in the range of 300 centigrades. So this is far below the intended operating temperature. It, on the other hand, it, it performs beautifully. It, it joins perfectly to tungsten and also to steel. So, um, well, what can we say? It needs strengthening. So here, palladium comes into play again. It might be a solution. Already uh, some studies have shown that it really works. If you alloy copper with palladium, then uh, it increases strength and also the higher temperature strength. That's a solution. If you want to have that and to use only copper, then this has a big effect on the design because then you cannot use, you cannot stress this uh, Races. You use copper more like a, like a glue. It's, it's good to, to seal, to vacuum seal uh, structures or things like that, but you always have to con consider and take into account that it's too soft to be used for structural application. That's the situation for joining. Now, oxidation, I think we can go rather quickly through it. I have shown you the results, what happens with, uh, uh, in terms of oxidation. So um, somebody calculated the requirement for uh, helium purity in terms of oxygen content. And the result was there is no problem at all, even at very high temperatures, for uh, using as a coolant as long as you keep it pure. And pure means ultra, extremely, super, ultra, squared, high, pure. Uh, in numbers, that's 0.1 parts per million oxygen. And well, if you keep your coolant that pure, then uh, oxidation is not a problem. And you could use this as a coolant, even at temperatures as high as 1,200 to 1,300 centigrades, no problem then. Swelling was another topic regarding irradiation. And there is uh, very few data. This is one of the uh, sources I have found on swelling of tungsten. They, if you remember, swelling is, has always a peak and, and Gaussian-like curves. I don't know why they have in the, you know, maybe since it was in the 70s, they uh, deviated from that curve, which is rather questionable. Please forget this part here. The curve sh is and will be more shaped like a Gaussian curve or peak-like. But this doesn't uh, change the result. In tungsten, we expect or have to expect swelling. It's not as high as in austenitic steel. But still, 
in the temperature range 6 to 900 C, there should or will be the, the peak in swelling. And this will be around uh, 1 and 2 percent. And then, depending on the design, we have to keep this in mind. If there is a tolerable swelling limit, we need to know this curve. A quite different story is irradiation hardening. We don't know anything about, or almost nothing about irradiation hardening. There are not so many experiments available. So the only thing what we can do now is, or, well, it's a proposal from my side, which you might now easily understand what I mean, since we have gone rather deep into this topic. We, uh, well, you could even take it as an engineering approach for lack of scientific data or something like that. So first step is take what you have. What we have is this recovery curves from recovery experiments from uh, yeah, resistivity recovery curves. This is how they look like, at least the interesting part for tungsten. Remember, in each case, when one of the hardening features are recovering, then you see it in a peak in this experiment. And somewhere at some temperature, there is no peak at all. This means the material has fully recovered. If we take this data and say, OK, this has been the annealing treatment for one hour. If the temperature exceeds 1200 C, then tungsten should be completely recovered. This is what we observe in steel for the Eurofair. This is the shift, the embrittlement, the hardening of uh, Eurofair depending on the irradiation temperature. And from this curve, we established the operating regime of Eurofair. We said, OK, up or down to 350C, the hardening is tolerable. It's not as much. It's uh, within a safe area. And well, with higher temperatures, there are no problems at all. So the possible operation temperature out of that diagram is in the range of 350C. Then we also did recovery experiments, also with a Chapi test. And what have we seen here is that um, after the, this is at the beginning, unirradiated, this is the hardening effect, the shift from there to there. Then uh, we have annealed this irradiated material at 550C for four hours, and then we are back to deadline. It's not a full recovery, but still it's a rather good recovery of the material. So this is the data we have on steel. Remember, recovery takes about 200 degrees C higher temperature compared to the lower limit in the operating temperature. So recovery takes place at higher temperature. Operating temperature could be 200 centigrades lower. That's maybe a rather oversimplified logic. But if we apply this to tungsten and say, OK, recovery is at 1,200. And OK, if there are still some uh, hardening feature left over at 1,000 C, they could still be tolerable. So we take this as the result for the recovery behavior and say, where does it end in a real operating regime? We do the same thing, 200 centigrades below, and you end up in the operating range of minimum 8 to 800 C to 100 C, 1000 C. That's one way to look at it. We could, you could simply have said, OK, or a physicist would, would have said, let's take the homologous temperature, compare it. But well, the result is the same. But in this way, I think it's much more fun because you have these nice arrows. OK, that's the, all we know about irradiation data. And then finally, and that's the end of the course, we do now a study, a design study, design assessment 
focusing on this few issues we have addressed and make an evaluation of the three different type of designs and see where material, let's say, meets design. Okay, let's start. Finger design, helium inlet temperature 600C, outlet temperature 700C. This results in an operating temperature at this part at 1170 degrees C and here at this critical joint we have 700 C. That's the operating condition. Now let's evaluate against these issues. Oxidation, it's okay. Swelling in the range of 3%. Let's say we are quite tolerable designers. Um, well, we don't know exactly, but uh, okay, what you have seen in the curve so far is okay. Embrittlement in any case here, uh, it, it's okay. Tungsten doesn't embrittle at 1170C. Then uh, what about this joint here? On the lower part we have steel, on the upper part we have uh, tungsten. So swelling is in the rain, uh, let's start down, sorry from the steel. At 700 C, we cannot use Eurofair. So here we already would need an ODS steel. The embrittlement of steel in at 700 C is perfect. You won't see anything except helium and we don't talk about helium here. So bracing at 700 C, we have seen there are solutions, not a problem. Well, I'm not sure whether you can tolerate 5% swelling in this red part here but okay if we are even more tolerant in design this might be tolerable but the embrittlement in steel at, uh, in, in tungsten at 700C is not tolerable. 700 centigrade that's too low for tungsten so this is certainly the death of that component here that's a no-go. What can you do? You can change the coolant temperatures or first give a rating by smileys, that's fine, that's also fine, that's not so fine here and um, then we change the temperature. Let's say okay if low temperature are the problem then we go up with the cooling temperature. Let's increase the inlet temperature to 700 and so the outlet temperature is 800 this increases these both critical temperatures here and here. Then again the assessment. Oxidation is fine, we have seen that. Swelling still 3%, the same. Embrittlement, no deal here, no problem. Grain growth is a problem, so uh, we replace tungsten by tungsten lanthanum oxide or something like that. That's also feasible then recrystallization or grain growth is not a problem. Here we are safe. Swelling in the range of 5%, that's still critical. Embrittlement we are not so sure, but 800 degrees C was the lowest, if we are very lucky, possible temperature to avoid embrittlement under irradiation. So this had to be confirmed. And again, bracing is okay. Embrittlement and steel is okay. But at 800 C, there is certainly no steel, not on this world and in our universe, who will work. And so uh, not even ODS is a solution. Then uh, we, the only thing we have done, we have shifted the smileys. Now here the tungsten armor is no problem. Also the joint between tungsten and steel. Well, might work, but uh, bracing, okay, but still no way. Is there anything else we can do? Yes, we can lower the cooling temperature. That's uh, easy to do. Let's come in with 400C and go out with 500C. Again, the same procedure as before. In the tungsten armor part, we are still safe. Swelling is even reduced, so even better here, I would give a full rating with respect to grain growth, embrittlement, swelling and oxidation here. It works. Then uh, 
it joined from tungsten to steel and still 500 C of that's even worse as before, no go for uh, embrittlement reasons here. Uh, the lower part, uh, well, tracing, forget it, that's working anyway. The lower part, steel, embrittlement at 500C, you know, Eurofair, that's the perfect operating regime here. No worries, also strength is high enough, everything. Again, we have shifted the smiley back. This is fine, this is fine. Uh, the smiley is on the on the wrong place. I'm sorry, <laughs> but you know where it has to go. Red to red. The smiley belongs to the joint. Uh, to, uh, oh well, it belongs to tungsten, so it's on the right place here. Tungsten and tungsten. That uh, doesn't fit. Good. This concept. Well, rate for yourself. Now let's come to the fully or to the tungsten diverter, the fully tungsten approach. Here we had the problematic issue with the tungsten to tungsten joints. This will operate around uh, 800C and again that's comparable to what we had before except that here we have 1300C, inlet is 700, outlet 800. Same considerations. At that high temperature oxidation still okay, swelling with 3% I'm not so sure but could be tolerable. Grain grows would require an uh, oxide dispersion strength or grain stabilized tungsten. It's feasible, could be working. For the bracing, well, we have said we need palladium, platinum. Well, I'm not so sure. This, in any case, requires or produces many question marks. Then uh, here, in this structure, we have swelling in the range of 5%. And if you think on these plates, they are one meter long, 5%, that's uh, already a significant amount. I don't think that you could tolerate it. And embrittlement at 800C, here we are under irradiation, quite at the edge of uh, things that could be possible. Uh, forget about the steel, that's uh, not interesting, that's just for the pipe inside, they are not loaded, so steel will never be an issue. But this bracing is, uh, for me, a non-solvable problem. Also here, the, the swelling, I don't think you could tolerate 5% swelling. Forget the smiling about, uh, a smiley about steel, this is not a, a structurally loaded steel part. No problem here. Again, same exercise. We go down with the temperature to 700 C here if we reduce the in and outlet temperature. This shifts the smileys a bit. Again, bracing is still a problem which cannot be solved on that scale. Also, the embrittlement is even more problematic as before. Steel gets a smiley, but again, forget about the steel inside. So, in general, a no-go. Then, finally, we are left over with this uh, paper study, preliminary study, whatever you would call it. Here, the temperatures are rather low. We wanted to come in with 450 degrees C helium, and then the outlet could be maximum 650 degrees C helium. And if this temperature 650C is still too high, I would like to throw away, waste the energy, mix it down again with cool gas, which is completely nonsense if you talk about the balance of plant. But as said, strategy here is I prefer a working diverter rather to a diverter which could produce energy only in theory but will never work. So. This is, in short, the strategy here. Again, same exercise. Oxidation is okay. Swelling with 4% in the tungsten armor part, well, this could be dealt with, like in the other ones. You need some uh, design measures, but uh, not such a problem. At least only one question mark as before. The embrittlement, that's the critical part here for, uh, 
bodies tungsten or tungsten material pipe, let's say. Grain growth in this temperature range is certainly no issue. That's rather low. Bracing of um, this tungsten pipe to steel pipe has been demonstrated. This can be done by copper or by a copper alloy that works. That's demonstrated. And the steel part, that's again the connectors and the inside pipe in that temperature range no problem because the temperature have been tailored just to the operating of these parts. So steel works, grazing should also work. What we don't know is the embrittlement of this laminated pipe. And uh, unfortunately, I have a bad feeling with that. At the moment, uh, such materials are irradiated, but well, I doubt it, but on the other hand, I'm uh, famous for being the worst pessimism in the whole fusion community. <laughs> I would disagree. I, I, I call this uh, realism, but well. So finally, thank you for being here. I hope I was able to provide you some one or rather uh, uh, interesting direction in uh, development of the broad, very broad topic in fusion in general, but also you see the many facets of materials and their applications and their impact on technology. And well, again, thank you for being here. Thank you for the lectures, and I would like to, to ask you a question about the, the tungsten tungsten bracing, because it seems to me that it's a non-solvable problem. So uh, I would like to ask about um, the ways of researching of the bracing to uh, uh, the um, uh, tungsten tungsten bracing, and uh, if it's going to be a dead end that it's going to, to make the fission reactor uh, unavailable for the future? Uh, well, this has been three questions, if I'm correct. So. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem. The tungsten tungsten bracing is possible. I have shown you, for example, copper uh, palladium alloys, which could do the trick. And uh, what's the name again of the university where Maria is? Uh, sorry, I can't repeat this in <laughs> Spanish, but you have uh, understood. Uh, there, uh, especially tungsten steel and also tungsten tungsten braces are developed. And the development is, uh, well, as always in materials, you see which produces uh, problems you can certainly not solve, neglect them, and focus on this one, which are uh, more or less promising. I have given you a variety of different materials with, which could finally work. And uh, well, then in the end, the next step is, and this uh, addresses your question, if you are sure that there is no optimum solution, then you have to see, or well, to come to the conclusion, well, then we have to live with the one or other drawback, but make the best out of it. And at some end, you are, or at some time, you are at the end of your wisdom or knowledge with respect to materials. And then, okay, you can summarize your work and say, these are the facts, this is reality, and then do what I like most, 
blame the designer. Say, it's your problem. Here, these are the limits of material. You have to live with it. But your third point, your third question, up to now I don't see the end of fusion or uh, uh, such a strong impact on, on, on all the fusion um, components. I have only shown you that these three specific ideas or concepts can be ruled out or criticized with your knowledge, what I have given you during the lecture. It's such easy. And this might be uh, the reason why, well, it, it's always my strategy. If you know the basics and some fundamentals, that's already enough to assess quite complicated things. You don't need to have all this highly scientific and, and, and I, I don't know what many million details. The principles and the most fundamental phenomena are sufficient to draw important conclusions and assess the impact on technology. Thank you. Hello. Uh, nice, uh, nice talk. Uh, sorry, I can't attend all the conference. But I have, in the beginning, some comment, and after I have a question. Comment. I am a guy from silicon carbide. I, we believe the silicon carbide we can use in fusion, in many applications, and only the tungsten. Also, I am chemist, and of course. You say, no chemist. No, no, you need <laughs> no chemist, chemistry, Oops. especially <laughs> in some. <laughs> okay, no. And after the question, we you saw many things is uh, from Plant from Austria. And I don't know if it's still working in the in the Higgs sinks. We were talking to the copper zirconium uh, copper zirconium alloy. You have a problem with the Higgs sink to remove the heat and also uh, to because the performance or it decrease a lot of the strength. Do you know if is Plant is still working to produce new Higgs sink with diamond? or not, or he stopped all the things about that. Okay, again, these are many topics. Let's start with uh, chemistry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, the next thing, diamonds, it's like platinum. I like this material pretty much, but well, under irradiation, it's not so stable. You end pretty soon in uh, graphite rather than diamond, and uh, I think Plancy produces each and everything as long as you pay the price. And I know they had this um, idea, and there was one project in industry where they had to produce uh, a mix of steel and diamonds. And, well, of course, in a non-nuclear application, and they do this, and I'm sure they, they, they will do it whoever needs it, but it costs you uh, some money. Then is um, copper and uh, diamond was your question. Uh, again, they could or certainly would produce it commercially. That's, uh, I don't think that's a problem, but still for fusion application, it's not feasible. That uh, doesn't work. And the, your first, was this also a question or was this a comment with uh, no, silicon, comment. silicon carbide? No, many people believe that the silicon carbide can use it in fusion reactors, especially you talk with the Japanese community. They believe that the solution for everything is silicon carbide. Yeah. In yeah. Europe, say tungsten. Right? Yeah. In, you are in the middle. Tungsten the for something and silicon carbide for another. Yeah. My view is that, uh, of course, since the silicon carbide is uh, fiber, 3D uh, woven fibers are uh, produced by Japanese companies and, and so they are very fond of it. I think this is worldwide the best silicon carbide material at all. And uh, again, also here you have to focus or um, to see how it will be used, how it will be applied. And the ideas of using silicon carbide as a uh, structural material is uh, not followed in Europe 
due to the price, due to the fact that no industry in Europe is producing such uh, 3D uh, fiber carbides, and also due to the fact that for a structural application there are much more issues even than in tungsten or other materials. But there is one exception, that the use of silicon carbide as an insulator for uh, liquid metal cooling or use. There I think that's a perfect match. And also in Europe, the idea or uh, concept still is based on silicon carbide. Whether such applications require mm. um, composite silicon carbide, I'm not sure. Maybe a much cheaper, uh, more economic way would use just silicon carbide inlets without fiber. But that's the general view. Thanks. More questions? No? That's all done. Thank you, everybody, for coming, and especially to, to Michael. It has been a pleasure for all of us. For and me, I too. Hope, Thank I you. hope that in the future we could have uh, again the opportunity to have you with us. Thank you very much. Thank you.